Do I keep my camera on? Uh, yes. yes. Mine's key. Uh, hi, everyone. We're going to get started in, in uh, about 20 seconds. We're just allowing people to file in to the Zoom room. All right. Well, people are still filing in, but I think we, we have a good crowd here already. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is John Davis. I'm president of OCTO, or Open Communications for the Ocean, providing ocean professionals with the knowledge and networks you need. Uh, we host this webinar series, as well as the MPA help discussion list, the EBM help discussion list, and ocean plastic list, among other services. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, also with me is Sarah Carr, uh, who runs each of the Octo projects I uh, just mentioned to you. She's handling the technical side of this webinar. And Octo is co-presenting this webinar with our frequent partner, the NOAA National MPA Center. Thank you. Uh, so MPAs are increasingly being promoted as an ocean-based climate solution. Uh, these claims bring with them a degree of uncertainty, however, uh, because the literature on the climate benefits of MPAs is fairly diffuse. Uh, and not well synthesized until now. Uh, our webinar presenter today, Joachim Claudet, uh, conducted a literature review of over 20,000 publications spanning 241 MPAs. His team's meta-analysis provided results that could be fundamental for the future planning of MPAs, not only in terms of addressing climate change, but I suspect also for navigating the 30 by 30 target. Uh, and this webinar will present these results and discuss the extent to which MPAs could be a useful tool for mitigating climate change and adapting social ecological systems. So this is how the webinar will work. Joachim will provide a presentation uh, on his study results, then we'll open the floor to questions from the audience for the remainder of the webinar, and we'll conclude the event about an hour from now. Uh, so if you have any questions during the webinar, uh, you can put them in the Q&A panel. Uh, and if you want to engage in any sidebar conversations, you can use the chat panel. And we'll be checking both spaces over the course of this hour. Uh, so, all right, uh, let's get started. Our presenter is Joachim Claudet. He is a researcher at the National Center for Scientific Research in Paris. Uh, he specializes in MPAs, environmental impact assessment studies, and coastal management. He has served on multiple international uh, committees on marine issues, teaches international workshops on MPAs, and authored the excellent book, Marine Protected Areas, A Multidisciplinary Approach. I interviewed him many times over the years for MPA News. This is Joachim Claudet. So hello, everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased uh, uh, to be here with you uh, today to present, uh, to present you this work um, that uh, took, uh, took quite some time, but I'm, I'm very happy uh, with how people are receiving it. Um, so I hope you see my screen right now, which uh, uh, you, you're supposed to. So the, the, the work was really to, to bring clarity and understand better uh, how MPAs uh, matter or not for climate change mitigation and, and adaptation. And um, before uh, starting and presenting you the, the and presenting you the results, uh, I really want to give praises to uh, to Juliette Jacquemont, who uh, who really brought a lot of her to this uh, um, to this work. And uh, this work has been the the inception of her uh, uh, PhD work. So. Uh, a lot more exciting papers are yet to, to come. So I, I'd start uh, with uh, something you, you, you all know, uh, which is that um, MPAs provide multiple social and ecological benefits. So they, they, can be, uh, they, they can provide positive outcomes in terms of biodiversity, conservation, fisheries, uh, benefits, uh, they can contribute to a sustainable blue economy. They can uh, decrease the risk of extreme uh, events, contribute to better ocean governance. And all the papers and references you are seeing right now on the screen are meta-analysis meta or, or reviews. So there is solid scientific evidence 
uh, on that. However, uh, before we were doing, uh, we've been doing this work, uh, MPAs were increasingly promoted as an ocean-based solution uh, to climate change, uh, but their contribution to uh, climate change adaptation and mitigation was really remaining uh, contentious. There was uh, papers that, that, that were showing some benefits, papers that uh, were showing the, the, the opposite. So uh, we wanted to bring some clarity uh, on that. So we, we based uh, the, the paper uh, and the study on different pathways through which MPAs can contribute or not to uh, uh, climate mitigation and adaptation. And first, we thought about uh, potential ecological pathways. And rather than starting from scratch, uh, obviously, uh, we use the literature and we, we look at what was known. And we, we looked at, uh, in particular, uh, this interesting, so I've got things in front of my screen. Okay, I'll try to get rid of the charts. I'm not sure, okay. Uh, in particular, we have this, uh, the, this paper from uh, uh, Bernhardt, Bernhardt and, and Leslie that looked at the different um, uh, ecological pathways uh, through which uh, th that can give a resilience of coastal marine ecosystems to climate change. Um, and so they thought about different resilient components that could be diversity, connectivity, and adaptive capacity. And for those of different ecological mechanisms, and then they thought about the strategies that can contribute uh, to positive outcomes on those ecological mechanisms. So we based partly our ecological pathways through which MPAs can contribute to climate change uh, mitigation adaptation on, on those. We also uh, used a lot the work of uh, Amanda Bates and, and colleagues uh, that looked at climate resilience in, in MPAs. And in particular, they, they, they uh, they've put forward this uh, protection paradox that uh, uh, I'm coming back on, on that later on. And so they, they looked at what could be expected from uh, protection from human activities on coastal ecosystems. Uh, and they look at the different mechanisms, so increased biogenic habitat, intact food webs, and the level of, uh, of evidence on that and how those could contribute to resistance and uh, recovery. We also based uh, the pathways on uh, uh, an important paper by uh, Kalu Murbert and, and many colleagues uh, that looked at that, who put forward many pathways through which MPAs can, can be used for um, climate adaptation and mitigation. Uh, but some of them were uh, um, evidenced by some studies. So this was a review. Uh, some of others were uh, hypothesized or were assumption and, 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 and uh, no study really assessed those. For example, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, uh, some on uh, MPAs that can provide stepping stone for dispersal and, and, and so MPAs that could increase connectivity. Uh, this is more hypothesis than, uh, than, uh, than evidence at the stage of this paper, while the protection of uh, uh, apex predators was really evidenced by, by some papers. Also, we wanted to look at the, the social pathways. Uh, we are not only interested in ecological adaptation of, of, of uh, ecosystems, but also in social uh, adaptation to, to climate change. And uh, similarly, we, we, we based our work on, on all of uh, what uh, amazing folks have done uh, before us, in particular, this work by, uh, by Josh uh, Sinner and, and colleagues on uh, the, the, different, the different dimensions of um, uh, adaptive capacity to climate change in coastal communities. And in particular, uh, adaptive capacity is dependent on, on assets, flexibility, organization, learning, and agency. And because we thought that potentially MPAs can contribute, can have positive or potentially negative outcomes on some of those dimensions, we accounted for those as potential pathways uh, building social adaptive capacity to climate change. Also, we built uh, our work on um, a great paper uh, from uh, Natalie Ban and, and many colleagues uh, who studied the well being uh, outcomes of, uh, of MPAs. And so we use some of those uh, social governance, economic, and cultural outcomes that, that she used or that they used in this paper 
as potential uh, social uh, pathways. And, and so then we complemented some of those uh, with, with our uh, expertise, uh, if we can, can say so. And, and so now this is our contribution uh, uh, to bring clarity to the debate on, on MPAs and, and climate change. So first, as, as uh, uh, you, you know, or, or, or you, you, you would know right now, we focused on mitigation and, and adaptation. Uh, and for adaptation, we thought about the different mechanisms that can be resistance, because adaptation can also be recovery, and it can be adaptive potential. So these are the, the, the mechanisms we, we focused on. And then we've identified pathways uh, to, to which MPAs can, can provide benefits. And, and so these are informed by all of the works uh, uh, I've just showed you, and we call them uh, the MPAs climate pathways. And so you can see that for mitigation, MPAs potentially can contribute to mitigation through carbon sequestration or acidity buffering, for example. For ecological adaptation through phenotypic plasticity, connectivity, stability, biodiversity, genetic diversity, body condition, reproduction, and coastal protection. And for social adaptation uh, through uh, having effects, positive or negative, uh, on assets, flexibility, social organizations, learning, and, and, and food security. So these are the pathways we focused on. Uh, and for that, we searched the, the, the literature. Um, and, uh, and once again, uh, Juliette uh, Jacquemont should be praised uh, 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 for that. And so it was a large endeavor because we, we, we found more than 20,000 papers that were screened, first for titled and, and abstract. And these are the numbers that you can see here. So these are the papers that were screened for each of those pathways. Uh, and then because we, we our, our aim was to do uh, uh, um, a meta-analysis. Uh, so we, we wanted to, 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 to quantify magnitude of effects, whether they were positive or negative. But because we found such a wealth of and, and a high number of papers, but so few could be used quantitatively, we decided to use a two-tier approach with first to do vote counting. And vote counting is to look at how many papers found, according to authors, a positive effect of a given indicator or a given pathway, and how many papers found a negative effect. So we did first a vote counting and then a, a quantitative meta-analysis. Um, so for the vote counting, we were able to keep a very limited amount of paper compared to the number of papers that were screened. So we kept 378 papers uh, from more than 240 MPAs. Uh, and first, what we can see from here is that there, is, there are gaps in evidence. And for example, we couldn't keep any papers that looked at effect of MPAs on acidity buffering, phenotypic plasticity, or connectivity. So we couldn't find any evidence on that, even only qualitative. Uh, and then from those papers, uh, we did the meta-analysis, keeping a subset of papers, those from which we could extract quantitative information and enough to compare within a given pathway, different papers uh, uh, to do uh, properly a meta-analysis. And here we can have a different level of gap so not gaps in knowledge because those papers or the, those pathways were studied and could be studied qualitatively. But from those papers, we couldn't extract any quantitative information. So this is gap in quantitative evidence for flexibility, social organization, learning and agency, um, because it is also very difficult to, to, to obtain strong quantitative indicators uh, on those pathways. And also we, we, we could see uh, uh, some uneven distribution of studies among, uh, among continents. This is just uh, uh, if, if some of you are interested uh, in that. And for example, for, for the mitigation pathways, most of the studies, even if many were coming from, from Europe, but most of the studies were coming from Southeast Asia, uh, mostly because many uh, uh, were about uh, mangroves and, 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 and tropical habitats. 
ecological adaptation, most of them were coming from Europe, and social adaptation, most of them were coming from a, uh, from a Southeast Asia and, 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 and a bit of uh, Oceania. So now let's dig a bit into, uh, into the results. So these are the indicators that were used for each of the pathways. And sometimes you can see that, for example, for social organization, uh, we had two indicators of our reproduction. We had two indicators because for those indicators, we were able to keep uh, enough studies to do the, the meta-analysis um, on them. So first, when we look and when we do the vote counting uh, of the papers, so here the, the, the greenish bars are the number of papers that say that the uh, outcome, their study, that the MPAs uh, or conservation had a positive effect on the studied outcome. Uh, the red ones the, is the number of studies where authors showed a negative effect uh, of MPAs on the outcome. Uh, green are neutral, and the kind of a purple one is uh, ambiguous when it was not possible for the authors to say whether it was positive or negative. Um, so what we can see from that is that there is a huge majority of social and ecological outcome uh, that are positive. Uh, it doesn't mean that they cannot be negative because even, for example, uh, here when you see majority of positive, you still have possible negative outcomes. So majority of positive outcomes, but for conflict resolution and user rights, where the majority of outcomes are negative. Okay, and I will come back to that on, on the conclusion of the paper because it is, uh, I believe, an important uh, aspect and result of the of our paper. Then let's start to dig in into the, the, the meta-analysis. So first, so I have put some arrows here to, uh, to guide you towards the pathways uh, we will be looking at. So now we are looking at ecological adaptation, the carbon sequestration, sorry, pathway. And these are the results of the meta-analysis. And first, when we look at blue carbon, so blue carbon ecosystem are those recognized by uh, IPCC for uh, carbon accounting scheme. So these are mangroves salt marsh and seagrass. Um, and uh, we will come to the individual results, but what we can see is that on average, uh, there is positive effects of conservation on blue carbon ecosystem in their capacity to sequestrate uh, carbon. And you can see that this is true for mangroves and seagrass, but not from salt marsh, for which we couldn't find evidence of MPAs on uh, uh, increased sequestration in, in conserved uh, salt marsh from MPAs, but very likely because MPAs are not the best tool for, for salt marsh because it is half uh, 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 terrestrial and marine and, uh, and, uh, and that might be why MPAs are not really fitted for, for salt marsh. Then for sediment, we found that unshold sediments, unshold sediments, sorry, uh, could sequestrate significantly more carbon than areas exposed to uh, trolling. Uh, so this is a, 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 an important result and we have uh, um, quantified that. And we will come back to that when we compare the, that by, by habitats. And then um, fish, so you see only N equals three, although this is the most studied component of anything about MPAs, but there is a kind of uh, asterisk here. And this is just to indicate that these are three meta-analyses. So here we, we did a meta-analysis on meta-analysis. So behind that three, there is many, many, many more papers. Uh, and so although all meta-analyses concur to say that there is uh, on average uh, large positive outcomes on, um, on fish biomass um, uh, from MPAs, there is still further research that is needed to quantify the exportation rates of the organic carbon from fish biomass towards uh, uh, sediment. So some caution needs to be uh, uh, taken here. Then when we look at, so once again, you have the arrows to get you, stability, biodiversity, uh, and, and all those with arrows are those from which we could do a meta that could be quantified, 
could, we could extract some quantitative information, you can see that we could find positive evidence on species diversity. Uh, we can find positive outcome of MPAs on reproductive potential. We could find and quantify, of course, on the magnitudes, uh, but I won't go into numbers uh, here, uh, and positive effect on, on accretion. So that means that MPAs can contribute to coastal protection, to reproduction, and to biodiversity. These are the pathways through which MPAs uh, can have positive outcome on ecological adaptation. But uh, once again, care should be uh, uh, taken here because when we are looking at other indicators of the same pathway, sometimes, for example, Shannon index for biodiversity, we couldn't find, uh, on average, any positive outcome of MPAs on, uh, on, uh, on uh, species diversity using Shannon index. While in terms of species numbers, so species richness, uh, we could find strong positive evidence. Uh, we could find evidence on reproductive potential, but not on recruitment. Okay, so we were able to show where either more research is needed or where MPAs can work uh, or not towards those uh, pathways. Then uh, we were able, uh, I believe, we believe to shed light a little bit on the conservation paradox that was uh, uh, put forward by uh, uh, Amanda Bates and, and, and her colleagues in, uh, in her paper. Uh, because in her paper, they, they, they rely mostly on, on benthic assemblages. Uh, and what we could do in our paper is that if we use um, um, evidence, uh, the, the papers that looked at resistance uh, those were 100% based on coral studies. And yes, on average, we couldn't find any positive effects uh, of MPAs. And on the contrary, there was even some uh, uh, a negative effect. So on average, uh, coral assemblages were less resistant in, uh, in MPAs. But as you can see, there are a few, few points here. Same thing for recovery. But this was once again 100% uh, uh, based on coral assemblages. But when we uh, looked at expected ecological adaptation based on those indicators of so stability, biodiversity, uh, reproduction. This was based mostly on fish species. Here we can see a positive effect. So saying that on average, MPAs can contribute to ecological adaptation, whether it is through resistance, recovery, or adaptation, it is largely, largely dependent on the type of uh, organisms um, we are uh, looking at. Now, uh, going a little bit deeper on the metallicis, we, can, we, we, we were able to show and to say that habitats matter. So as, as we, we touched on uh, a little bit before, in terms of carbon sequestration, it works in mangroves, in seagrass, and not in salt marsh. So, uh, um, and for coastal protection, we were able to see same thing. So more accretion, in mangroves that are conserved compared to, to uh, those that are impacted. And it was not the case for uh, salt marsh. Then when we look at, uh, so this is not anymore about MPAs here. This is the potential of a given habitat uh, to sequestrate carbon or to buffer uh, acidity or to uh, uh, do some uh, sediment accretion or to uh, to do some wave attenuation. Uh, we looked at both blue carbon ecosystems, so mangrove, tidal marsh, and seagrass, and other kinds of ecosystems. Okay? And what we can see here, uh, first, we can say that there is a major knowledge gaps um, uh, on how uh, conservation affects macroalgae living biomass, and thus their contribution to carbon sequestration. We are not able to find evidence of carbon sequestration in macro good that we could uh, uh, synthesize here. Uh, another thing that we could uh, uh, put forward is that the huge potential uh, with sediment, because as you can see, sediment can sequestrate per, uh, uh, per unit of area much less carbon than mangroves, southern march, or, or seagrass. And this is why those are already integrated in, in carbon accounting schemes. Uh, so although their sequestration capacity per unit of area is much lower, their extent 
uh, on the global ocean is much larger. So although, once again, much more information is needed to understand the, 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 the correlates with carbon sequestration in sediments, depending on depth, temperature, current, uh, latitude, etc., there is a huge potential here uh, for carbon uh, sequestration. And so to leaving carbon, allow me kind of in peace without a uh, trolling in those, uh, in those areas. Also, what we were able to, uh, um, to show is that uh, levels of protection matter. Um, so uh, going into details here, we were able that we were, we are not able to see any positive climate outcomes of MPAs of pro level of protection lower than being fully protected or highly protected. So those that are moderately protected or lightly protected using the uh, um, protection levels of the MPA guide, we were not able to see uh, on average positive effects, as you can see with the effect size that overlaps zero. But the confidence, 95% confidence interval of those effect size overlap zero. So we, we cannot say that on average, there is any uh, positive uh, outcomes of those uh, MPAs. We were able to see that climate, there were climate benefits uh, from fully protected areas. And even in terms of income and in, term, in, in terms of uh, uh, CPUE, so a catch per unit of effort. And so, the catch per unit of effort is not made here in fully protected area because in fully protected area, there is no extractive activities. So there is no fishing, but it's, uh, in, it's when we looked at um, uh, CPUE in between before and after around a fully protected area or between very close and further away from the fully protected area. All the details on how we've done that is in the paper and in the supplementary material. There is full transparency in each study that we use. So some of them are before, after, and some of them are control impact, and the control is further away from the impact. And what we can see here is that there, there are some climate benefits uh, in terms of CPUE and uh, carbon sequestration from highly protected areas. But there is a but here, as you can see, there are three dots. The but is only when there is the presence of a fully protected area. So basically, there is more CPUE inside or around highly protected area only when there is a fully protected area. Because if you look at here, a highly protected area without fully protected area around, we were not able to see positive effect on CPUE. Well, it was the case when there was a fully protected area. So many effects and many climate benefits of MPAs are entirely dependent on the presence of a fully protected area in the system. So whether the MPA is entirely a fully protected area or if there is a zoning with different levels of protection in the MPA, which can be very useful in uh, uh, allocating space for different users and, and gears and activities, there is a need to have a fully protected area in the system for the MPA to deliver some uh, climate positive outcomes. At least this is what we found in the, in the published literature. So what we can say from that is climate benefits as other social ecological outcomes. Now the, 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 the literature on that is increasing and increasing that those outcomes, the multiple outcomes, the social ecological outcome and climate outcomes of MPAs do depend on the level of protection, even from for the social ones. And all the papers here are meta-analysis. So now I've, I've, I've added the new one that I've just presented to you, but the others are meta-analysis or, or, or reviews. And they all show that uh, outcomes are tied to the level of protection. Fully protected area, although they're delivering uh, uh, most of the positive outcome, then highly protected area, there is a decrease, and then there is a very strong um, quantitative and qualitative gap uh, uh, with other levels of, um, of protection. So uh, uh, I've uh, extracted three main key messages from, the, from this, uh, this, um, uh, this study, what we've just uh, have been through. First, that uh, there is a 
I, I believe uh, the, the clear signal that protection level should take precedence uh, in MPA design is in stark contrast to the current paradigm of ocean protection globally, with propulsion of fully and highly protected area plummeting as countries are rushing to meet area-based conservation commitments with much lower levels of protection. But for now, we do lack evidence of those uh, MPAs providing positive benefits uh, throughout the range of positive of potential outcomes of, uh, of MPAs. Also, and this was the first result uh, I've showed you uh, uh, in this talk, that the, the diverse effects of MPAs on social organization and agency of coastal communities underscore the fact that governance is a fundamental factor in determining whether MPAs will enhance or impeded social adaptation. We've seen that MPAs can have positive effect on social adaptation, but they can have also some negative effect. So governance, how uh, uh, local voices are, are heard or integrated or uh, respected user rights are fundamental aspects of, of MPAs and of their capacity to deliver social benefits on uh, adaptation. Uh, and also, uh, we've seen that there is a considerable scope to expand uh, the consideration and recognition of MPAs in national climate strategies, uh, including NDCs and adaptation plans. So uh, we thought there is scope to, 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 to better account for, for MPAs. And uh, this led me to the, the, this final slide, because um, uh, this work uh, uh, that, that was uh, uh, funded by um, um, Pew Ocean Legacy was done with the Ocean and Climate Platform, and they've done uh, two policy briefs out of the, the, this work that was delivered at uh, COP26 in Glasgow and COP27 in, in Sharm el-Sheikh in uh, Egypt, uh, and some events were organized out of those results, and so you have links here. Uh, the links, I believe, will be also uh, shared in the in the chat. But this is a link uh, to the policy brief on the roles of MPA for climate change mitigation that was done by the, the Ocean Climate Platform. This is the link on the brief uh, that was done um, by the Ocean and Climate Platform on MPAs and climate change adaptation. And this is the link of the, the scientific article I've just uh, uh, review the, the, the results um, with you right now. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joachim. Um, we, we may uh, have you put up those those links again uh, later on in, in this uh, in this Q and A session. But we we now open up the webinar to uh, to the audience for the next uh, twenty seven minutes. Uh, again, if you have a question for Joachim, uh, you can submit it in the question box that is on the control panel on screen, and we'll be drawing from those questions throughout this Q&A session. Uh, the first question we received uh, was a, a, just in terms of, um, of um, kind of terminology. What is the difference between climate resilience versus climate adaptation capabilities, or is there a difference? Uh, it, it's it's uh, uh, as we we we've uh, uh, we, we've 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 done in the paper uh, we we've um, so let me take back the the slide yes uh, we didn't use resilience because resilience means a lot of different things for a lot of different people uh, and all of them are right I'm not saying that there is a a right understanding of resilience and a wrong understanding of resilience. But because resilience can be uh, so many different things, uh, we decided not to use this term as is. And what we used is adaptation. And within adaptation, we thought about resistance, recovery, and adaptive potential. Uh, and we've defined them uh, uh, in, in, in the paper. And it's true that adaptive potential and resilience can be uh, uh, can be similar, but uh, resilience is very often something that has been observed, is how a given system recover, while the adaptive potential is before this, this happens. Uh, and it is a mix of adaptive potential and recovery. Uh, 
So this is why we have uh, not used uh, resilience as this. That's great, thanks. Um, we had a question on um, uh, accounting for false positive uh, results uh, uh, potentially being included in the meta-analysis. So was, was any potential bias uh, toward um, positive findings accounted for in your meta-analysis and how did you account for it? Uh, so yes, my answer is yes, but as in many meta-analyses, um, and, um, but uh, there is a but, uh, yes, the answer is yes. Uh, but as many, any meta-analysis or any review, huh? uh, the, the scientific literature it is always more easy or easier, sorry, to publish positive findings than null findings. Uh, but my but is really centered about the topics because there is controversy around MPAs and their use in, a, in, a, in, in climate change in particular, but many other aspects of fisheries. Uh, there is a lot of people who are there, and, 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 and thanks to them, and it is how science is being made, who are really trying to show when MPAs don't work. Uh, and so there is room, more room now in, in, in the published literature for those voices to be heard. And, and so there are more and more uh, uh, people publishing uh, cases where MPAs don't work, whether because it is for lack of uh, integration of, uh, of uh, uh, coastal communities or stakeholders in, in management, or because uh, a given type of MPAs cannot be used to deliver any uh, fisheries benefit, etc. So we've all of obviously those papers that were published were accounted for. So I believe in the realm of MPAs, there might be less uh, difficulty in publishing null results than in some other fields uh, because there is controversy and editors are aware of that, and so. Uh, it is maybe easier to publish null result compared to uh, to some other uh, to some other field. But yes, as any synthesis of the literature, there is a publication bias. But so we synthesize what the literature is saying. Uh, this is a, a, a snapshot of the of the literature. Great, thank you. Um, we had several questions um, dealing with particular uh, geographic regions uh, of the world. Uh, your meta-analysis was obviously taking a look at a, you know, a more holistic uh, view, uh, but uh, we had questions on how many of the studies looked at North American MPAs. Uh, it seemed like there were clusters of papers in the Caribbean or Bahamas. Uh, did you do any analysis of the research related to uh, the country or region socioeconomic rating. Uh, and then one other person uh, wondered if Antarctica um, was, was included in your meta-analysis. Uh, okay, so I, uh, I don't think we had Antarctica uh, in, our, uh, in, uh, in, in the meta-analysis. And did we do any uh, within continent or within country uh, assessment? Uh, no, because uh, there were not enough replication for given indicators uh, to, to do that, or it could have been only on one pathway and one indicator and not on the others. So uh, uh, we didn't do it, but it is something, if there is enough papers to do that, uh, uh, it, it can be done, but of course, as you can see, there is variability in the results. We have quantified that with the confidence interval. And so we are not saying that MPAs are always positive. Uh, uh, and we have even found some negative effect huh? uh, or, or null effect. But even for the positive effect, there is variability. And we have not went back to the papers that are positive, that are negative. But it can be easily tracked. We have done the vote counting. And so we have shown how many we, we have been fully transparent huh, on the paper, so people can see how many negative results, how many positive uh, results were assessed because we have presented all the vote counting results. So everything is, is, is in the paper. That's great, thanks. Um, one more question on geography. Is there a strong geographic component to this, whereas uh, with certain benefits are more relevant in particular geographies? 
Sorry, can you can you can you ask the question again? Sorry. So your your findings were they were there particular geographies where they were your findings were stronger than in others? Yeah, but it, it it is relating to it is related to the first question you, you've asked because we have not done any comparison per uh, per geography. Uh, I I cannot answer to that question, uh, but. Uh, and also because many, as I've shown before, many pathways were more studied in one geography compared to another. For example, social pathways were mostly assessed and studied in tropical coastal communities. So this comes mostly from Southeast Asia and Oceania. And so we couldn't compare that with the other areas. Great. Did you examine any aspects of scale? Uh, was there a minimum size of a fully protected zone needed to convey these benefits um, uh, that, that you saw? And, and I'd be interested in, in the implications for, for pursuing the 30 by 30 target where we're gonna have to designate a lot of quite large MPAs in order to, to reach that target in the coming years. Yeah, so we saw uh, a, an effect of size on uh, some of the, of the pathways. So positive relation with size and the pathways, but uh, I will never uh, talk about any minimum size for MPAs because this depends a lot on the type of ecosystems, the type of habitat, the type of species, the, the level of intensity of human impact around that MPA. Uh, so giving, I mean, talking about such a number while there is huge viability in outcomes and context, uh, I think is not very wise, uh, but we saw a relationship with, with, with size as in most of the outcomes, but it doesn't mean that a small MPA cannot be effective. Okay, we, there are many, many situations, many contexts in which MPAs would be the one that is the better uh, trade-off in between ecological adaptation and social adaptation, for example. Uh, but for most of the ecological mechanisms, the bigger, the better. But I'm not saying that for every aspect of MPAs. So uh, it really depends. All right, thanks. Uh, a question on um, on some of your criteria in this study. Does a positive score for biodiversity, for example, summarize studies that show a direct effect of MPA diversity on specific climate impacts, or is this a more indirect assessment? Uh, that is, if MPAs increase diversity, we assume this to be a positive thing for climate effect mitigation. Yes, is exactly the, the, the letter, the latter option. Uh, we, and this is how we have structured the, 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 the whole paper, huh? because there were so few uh, studies that really looked at MPA's effect on climate change adaptation uh, as is. We looked at the pathways that can contribute to adaptation. Uh, and so uh, we considered that biodiversity but building on all the work I've presented in the introduction of the, of the talk, huh? uh, building on the works of others, we consider that biodiversity and other pathways can contribute to adaptation to climate change. And then we looked at studies uh, that assess increase or decrease of biodiversity inside MPAs compared to uh, similar conditions, uh, whether they were before uh, it was before after control impact or before after control impact. Uh, yeah. Great, thanks. Uh, do you have a sense of how many of the 241 MPAs included in your study have clear climate change objectives as part of their establishment? Do you have any sense? Uh, of that? So, the the scientific objective answer is no, because we have not gone through each of those. Uh, a management plan or decree or uh, bylaws, etc. Uh, but what I can answer from the experience of uh, uh, a paper I've contributed to that focused on the Mediterranean Sea, and we look precisely at that, at how many MPAs were looking at, uh, were specifically mentioning climate change 
uh, in their objective, it was very, very few. Uh, but I am kind of, uh, uh, um, I don't think it's a bad thing. I mean, because the, most of the, the, the main reason for us to do this work was because there were not solid evidence of whether MPAs can contribute or not to MPAs, uh, to uh, climate change adaptation or mitigation. Uh, and so if we consider that without solid evidence, uh, you shouldn't build a management plan or just intuition or, or, or good guesses. Uh, maybe now it's the time to include uh, um, climate change more in, in, uh, in management plans. Yeah, what I think about with MPAs uh, quite often is uh, the ocean is changing in some ways fairly rapidly. Uh, and yet, we have a challenge in front of us in the coming years to designate a lot of MPAs and cover a lot more of the ocean with, with protected areas. Uh, what will those MPAs look like 50 years from now uh, in light of the changes that are going on? How does your study inform uh, thinking around setting up MPAs that will still be relevant you know, 30 or 50 years from now? So um, we have not looked at the uh, adaptive capacity of MPAs to climate change. Uh, but uh, I don't know if I can mention that, but uh, uh, I've contributed to a paper that uh, I think I can, because now it's uh, it's uh, released on the, on the website. It's uh, have just been published in the in Journal of Applied Ecology. It was led by uh, Orid Fried, and supervised by uh, Lodi Yoni Belmaker, uh, with a, a few folks uh, who contributed to the to the paper, and we looked with with experimental data at uh, MPA effectiveness. So using as indicator uh, fish biomass and abundance, a ratio, something that is used very commonly in the ecological MPA literature, uh, and comparing inside, outside, or before, after. Once again, uh, and we looked at 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 this indicator of effectiveness across MPAs along the Med, uh, where there is a very steep uh, temperature gradient. And we use that as a potential indirect uh, indicator of how MPAs would behave when temperature would increase. And what we saw is that um, where temperature was higher, there was lower effectiveness of MPAs. Uh, so lower differences between inside and outside, but the differences were still maintained. Uh, so uh, what we concluded is that uh, MPAs can uh, remain uh, a useful tool uh, even with some of the uh, already ongoing manifestation of, uh, of climate change. And in particular, we are looking at increases in, in water temperature. So the paper is, is, is out. I can, I can potentially uh, uh, share the link. That'd be great. Thanks. And again, the the link to uh, the paper that this webinar is on is included in the chat at the very top of the chat. It's a there's a Bitly link there, MPACC article uh, for anyone who hasn't hasn't seen that yet and taken a look at it. Um, and in and terms, just, sorry, I've just put the link of the paper I, I, I've mentioned. Uh, and I see there is a lot of things in the chat. I, I'm, I'm just, so people know I'm not looking at the chat, huh? so I'm just uh, <laughs> following you. How, how important is it to consider transboundary MPAs uh, in terms of uh, adapting or mitigating uh, climate change effects? So uh, I, I, I have two answers uh, to that. Um, it is, super important as uh, fish moving organisms or those that are suicide but that have larvae, they don't know our political boundaries, obviously. We all know that. So it is very important. Also because uh, fish stocks will move and there is strong implication in terms of uh, food security, in terms of uh, livelihoods uh, in, in many areas of the world. And having MPAs, even some of those that can be fished, but that, that can be used 
for shared uh, governance between countries of a shared resource, the, there might be very useful. So this is my uh, first option to answer the question. My second option to answer the question is that it is tremendously difficult to build transboundary MPAs. And we have so many nationally designated or MPAs within national waters that already exist and that would deserve increase in the level of protection, increase in management capacity, that I would say this is a low hanging fruit to improve our uh, conservation outcomes globally. Why should we go for something that is super difficult to put in place while well, we have things that don't work, but for which we know the fix and it is much easier to put in place as it belongs only to one given political will. If you put many political wills, will into the, 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 uh, the debate, it is much more complicated to have, uh, uh, I kind of doubt that many of those MPAs will be fully protected, for example. Well, we know this is what works the best. So yes, we need them. Yes, we need to go for them. But we also need to improve the many, many, many MPAs we have uh, that are either paper packs because they are not funded or that are underprotected because they don't have the levels of protection that are needed for them to be, uh, to be effective at all. <clears throat> And I, 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 would, I could give you, so uh, sorry, huh? you, you are not asking me the question, but uh, I would give the, the very same answer to uh, uh, dynamic MPAs. Uh, many, and you mentioned, uh, and uh, it's horrible to count years, but you mentioned the, the book on MPAs uh, I've, uh, I've edited, it was uh, more than 10 years ago. Uh, and, and there were a chapter on that. So I do believe it's, a, it's an important issue on dynamic MPAs uh, and this, are on the paper, the one that would be the most adaptive to climate change, because you can uh, follow ecosystems uh, or stocks that move or migrations, et cetera. But yes, we need to, in to, to, to invest uh, science, to invest capacity uh, into those MPAs. But at the same time, this will be super difficult to implement and to monitor. Uh, while we can, there is so many things that we can do more easily uh, that would deserve our attention to increase our, uh, our uh, conservation effectiveness uh, nationally and, and globally. Great, thanks. Um, how can climate change objectives be integrated in MPA planning when, when long-term metrics are almost impossible to develop because no one knows what the outcome will be? How can you, how can you um, account for those potentially significant unknowns in planning an MPA? I, I, I would say uh, 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 with, uh, I hope uh, you would accept that some uh, humility, that the pathways we have identified, once again, uh, uh, largely informed by uh, works, work of, uh, from uh, others before us, but that we have synthesized uh, uh, in, in the paper, you know, the thing with mitigation in blue, and ecological adaptation in green and social adaptation in orange, those pathways for which we have also identified indicators can be the mechanism that are incorporated in management plans. Because these are indicators you can easily track for which you can easily have objectives uh, that can be even independent of, uh, of having an objective related to climate change, but they all concur to uh, climate change benefits, whether through adaptation or through mitigation. So rather than having uh, an, an, an overarching objective or I want my MPA to increase adaptation, uh, having something around, I want my MPA to increase reproductive potential, to increase species diversity, uh, and to increase uh, recruitment is something you can easily measure and for which you can also derive a lot of potential uh, outcomes that are not necessarily related only to, to climate change. So I would say that this can really guide uh, indicators that can be tracked uh, in, uh, in MPA uh, planning, monitoring, and, and, and management. Great, thanks. Um, in terms of your study, are you thinking to maybe expand it 
to analyze it via GIS to compare your results against uh, a variety of existing data? I'm not sure we don't understand what is meant by that. To use covariates, you mean from the from the area the MPAs were coming from? That's my understanding of it. Um, and if if you don't have an answer to that, uh, what are your next? Uh, where are you taking this study uh, in the future? Um, yeah. So yes, understanding. So. I, I'm trying. I will try to take it to to where the the, the, the where I think the question uh, is coming from, which is to understand better uh, drivers and correlates of of uh, of those answers. And this is what we've tried to to start to do by looking at the level of protection and and MP size. These were mostly. Uh, um, um, uh, covariates that were related to the MPA themselves. Uh, but I was mentioning for, uh, for sediment, for example, understanding better how uh, depth matters, how uh, latitude matters for carbon sequestration, understanding better the timing of those effects, understanding better the enabling condition of those effects is clearly uh, uh, one of the aspects I want to, uh, uh, to go forward with. Great, thanks. Uh, there, there are uh, several MPAs that uh, include deep sea waters. Uh, do you think that that uh, both your ecological and social pathways apply to to them? Uh, that this is really dependent on on the type of ecosystems uh, and the type of habitats we are uh, talking about. Uh, uh, so it will depend really, uh, really, really on that. Um, but it is one of the, the aspects we are working on right now with, uh, with uh, Juliette, uh, Jacques Mont. So uh, more soon, it's like a teaser. Could the lack of evidence for salt marsh, um, uh, salt marsh mitigation indicate that these habitats are not often included within MPA boundaries? You, you mentioned at one point in your presentation that salt marshes might not be great places for MPAs and other management uh, strategies might be best. Yes, I think so. But this is really my personal uh, feeling. It's not based on, on, on evidence per se. Uh, uh, with my expertise of MPAs, I think they are uh, uh, um, a greater tool to uh, manage what happens uh, uh, on land. Uh, sorry, uh, in the water, and they are clearly impacted uh, with what happens on land, but very often there is a, a disconnect between uh, regulations, legislations, uh, inland and in the water, which makes very complicated to integrate them into a, a park that is terrestrial and marine, although there are many examples huh, of, uh, of terrestrial and marine parks that indeed do work, uh, but it's more the exception rather than the, than the norm. Um, and so, yeah, this was uh, this was uh, this was my point. My point. All right. Um, one question that uh, somebody asked, and and I've kind of added some of my thoughts to it as well. What what are the main challenges faced by MPA planners in uh, integrating your findings in MPA planning, and how can those challenges be met? Yeah, so um, I would try to answer that question uh, by saying it is time. Because the, most of the evidence, as, as I've showed in the conclusion of the talk, says that uh, um, uh, for many aspects, when you have a fully protected area, the, the, the benefits are larger than the cost, with some caveats, with really a need to focus on governance, stakeholder engagement, user rights, etc. cetera. Uh, but many of, of the outcomes that are assessed are much larger or are larger uh, than, than the cost in terms of fully protected area. So these are the MPAs that work the best. But they need some time 
to provide those benefits. And at the beginning of the implementation, while the ecosystem has not yet recovered, and while the recovery of the ecosystem has not spilled over to contribute to fisheries and other kind of benefits outside of the MPA, depending once again on the species and ecosystem, this might take five to seven years. Uh, sometimes it starts after three years, but it takes time. And at that moment, the costs are larger than the benefits. And so I think this is the major challenge we have, that the timing of nature is different than the timing of, uh, um, uh, of uh, electoral uh, mandates, you know, of uh, a city hall, a president, or uh, uh, someone in a governmental uh, agency or fisheries agency. And so I think uh, uh, there are many ways to deal with that. And, uh, and, um, and we have subsidies for many things, right? Uh, uh, we know a lot of harmful subsidies. I don't want to enter that debate right now because I think we don't have the time and it's not the place probably. Uh, but we also have, for example, uh, in Europe, uh, when some uh, offshore wind farms uh, are established in European waters, there are some mechanisms to subsidize fisheries who cannot fish anymore in this area. So why not doing a similar uh, mechanism when we establish a fully protected area? We subsidize those users, and it might not be only fishers, huh, for whom the costs are larger than the benefits at the beginning. And the, 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 the subsidy mechanism decreases when the benefits are spinning over and, and, and fishers or other users uh, uh, get uh, uh, back the, the benefit from the MPA. So uh, I think it's a matter of, of choice. Uh, so mechanisms are possible for that. But I would say it is the major challenge of why we are not establishing a, a more fully protected area. It's the time needed for them to deliver benefits. That's great. Uh, well, why don't we leave it there? Uh, thank you for that, Joachim. Um, uh, we conclude this webinar now. I want to thank you, Joachim, for, for contributing your insights and taking time to, to um, share and explain your paper with us. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you back here. And there are many, many thanks in the chat <laughs> to you for, for, uh, for your research and, and your taking time. And I look forward uh, the to- The pleasure is mine. It's always a pleasure interacting with you up to MPN News. Yeah. Thanks for That's all the, the, thanks. the work you, you're doing for MPAs. Thanks. Thanks. It's our pleasure as well. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you in person at Impact 5 next month. Yeah. Um, and I thank the audience for, for all your questions and ideas. Uh, I'm sorry that we didn't get to all of your questions, but thank you very much for, for sending them in. Uh, Joachim will be able to see your questions um, afterwards in, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the results. Uh, and this was one of the, the largest uh, webinars we've had in the past year. Uh, so it's, it's a privilege to have had uh, all of you here. Uh, so have a great day, everybody. And thank you again. Bye-bye.